Karl-Heinz Oswald, an artist from Mainz in front of his latest work. He is producing a sculpture of the young baron Pierre de Coubertin for the International Olympic Committee. The historian and pedagogue who made sport known all over the world as an intense joy of effort and who is nevertheless known as the most famous unknown person. At the age of 74, Coubertin dies on the 2nd of September 1937 in Geneva and leaves ideals, visions, 1100 articles, 34 books and five rings. If it was possible, his successor, the present IOC president, would like to tell him... I would say thank you. To celebrate the Olympic Games is to lay claim to history. History is also the best guarantee of peace. To ask people to love one another is merely a form of childishness. To ask them to respect each other is not utopian, but in order to respect each other, they must first know each other. Coubertin believes that the Greek heritage incorporates everything. To him, Olympia represents body culture. It symbolizes the protection of one's own country, an aspiration for beauty, health and vitality, which can be achieved through the harmonic balance of body and soul. The pupils from the Greek Pierre de Coubertin Grammar School in Pyrgos about 30 kilometers from Olympia, know that the javelin used to be held with a loop and they are able to do it themselves. They also know that the standing jump used to be done with weights and that the discus was out of iron and dingbat and often had different sizes. The school's curricular program still includes ancient sports which remind the pupils of the classic antiquity and the origin of Olympia. At the foot of the mountain Cronion, on the premises of the Olympic Academy in Olympia, Coubertin's heart was entombed in March 1938. And that is where a memorial was built in his honor. I think he would be surprised about the complexity of Olympia today, but he would quickly understand that the original idea still exists. If the games today are compared with those at that time, it is still possible to find the same values. And the games still take place every four years, which makes them very special. They are a rare and significant event, and as in the Greek tragedy, there's unity in time, space and action. The games always take place in one city and one place. They last two weeks, and not one day longer. The most famous athletes are present and perform in the most important disciplines. Everybody is at the same place at the same time. In search of Pierre de Coubertin, yesterday and today, we meet Jacques Goul, 82, at Lake Geneva. He gets to know Coubertin at the beginning of the 30s in Lausanne and learns from him. You could always see them coming, Pierre de Coubertin and his secretary, Dr. Messerly, who was always with him. Coubertin was elegantly dressed with cufflinks. We even dreamt of those cufflinks because they always dangled at the height of our eyes. We were always very impressed by him, also by his moustache and his general appearance. He was always well and correctly dressed, a respectable appearance. Coubertin gave us the impression of being an old man, 
but we got to know him better and better. He was very nice and always called me Jackie. We nearly saw each other every day. At the end of his life, Coubertin leads a very secluded life, but still keeps in contact with the youth. An example, spontaneous lessons in VD. He just took off his jacket and the cufflinks and rolled up his sleeves. Then he took a bow with a net to which we could hold on. We could already swim a little bit, but only like little dogs do. It was Coubertin who taught me breaststroke swimming. I feel honored to have been one of Coubertin's students. The picture of a man whose great life's work has also become the life's work for many a scholar such as Professor Dr. Norbert Müller of the University of Mainz, chairman of the German and International Pierre de Coubertin Committee. All over the world there are 40 national associations, www.coubertin.ch. But how present is the Baron today? We need Coubertin to preserve his heritage, that means the heritage of the IOC. His philosophy is very important when we try to carry out new reforms because many of the more recent developments of Olympia are not in line with the original idea anymore. Let's just think of the exaggerated commercialization, for example. There are people who say if Coubertin heard this, he would turn in his grave. Or others who think that we have to go back to the origins of Olympia, that we need Coubertin's educational approaches. In our times, however, this is not realistic anymore, but Coubertin is still present as a kind of godfather. And sometimes we can say that we have to remember our origins. Because if the IOC appears to be no more than the administrator and organizer of a multidiscipline world championship, that means an organization without any educational or ethical basis, then there is no reason why other organizations couldn't do this job at least as well as we do. Coubertin is to be found in strategically important positions. For example, in the French Olympic and Sports Committee, in front of the sponsors. Or painted on canvas, smiling mildly, Pierre de Coubertin is born on the 1st of January in 1863 in Paris, in Rue Audinot, 20. He attends the Jewitz College saint Ignace and later, against his parents' wishes, he studies at the École des Sciences Politiques, back then the meeting point of many left-wing Republicans. At the same time, he enrolls in law school, probably to reassure his parents. Later, he talks about the free spirit that he received thanks to his political studies. But soon he sees a dormant potential in the Anglo-Saxon education system that he considers even greater than anything that the French education system used to know. He visits the school of rugby, where the work of the education reformer Thomas Arnold is pursued. Arnold's reform consists in the attempt to attribute the same importance to physical as to intellectual and religious education. When Coubertin reads the student's novel, Tom Brown's School Days, he finds himself in a world he shall never forget. The adult should be free, as well as the child. It is important to teach the children the right use and the significance of freedom. Do not keep away the children from the world. In Athens, Evangelos Sapas founds the Zappian Games in 1859. In 1889, Coubertin visits the Venlock Olympian Games in England. I think that other people could have come up with similar ideas not long after Coubertin did. But he was very persistent, and he knew how to write in a wonderful way. As a member of the Journalists' Association of Paris, he wrote down everything immediately, according to the principle of what is written won't be forgotten. He published his articles and brought his manuscripts to the editors personally. He had the pamphlets printed with his own money, had good public relations, and thus a head start. 
Being a member of the aristocracy, he enjoyed a lot of good relationships. Wherever he went, people were impressed by his name, and he was never shown to the door. Even Pope Pius X gave him an audience. I think he knew how to use his name and his relationships. From the French side, he is influenced by Jules Simon, the initiator of the World Peace Movement, and Father Henri Guidon, whose words, faster, higher, stronger, become Coubertin's slogan. In 1892, he first mentions his Olympic idea and puts it into concrete terms two years later at the Sorbonne in Paris. Let us export rowers, runners and fences. There is the free trade of the future and the cause of peace will have received a new and mighty stay. This is enough to encourage me to dream now about the second part of this program, the restoration of the Olympic Games. Coubertin decides that the first performance of the Hymn to Apollo, which had been found in Delphi only one year earlier, should provide the fitting musical framework for the Foundation Congress of the Modern Olympic Games in Paris, 1894. On the 23rd of June, 1894, follows the announcement of the rebirth of Olympic Games and the implantation of the IOC. At that time already, establishing youth games in the Olympic program after the example of the antiquity is proposed. An idea which, as a legacy of the presidency of Jacques Rocker, becomes realized in Singapore in 2010. Also, it was laid down that the first games were to be held in Athens, the second in Paris, and all following in a rhythm of four years, who then was allowed to take part, who is an amateur, who is a professional. I think that Pierre de Coubertin sometimes was too idealistic. He believed that sport could bring peace to the world, but of course, it's not like that. We still have the Olympic symbol of truce for the duration of the Olympic Games, and this is good. But nowadays it doesn't make sense to believe in sport as the peacemaker. How should this work? Thousand-year-old religions and civilizations have failed. Why should sport succeed in achieving this? We can make a contribution, but only on a small scale. The Olympic Committee in the year 1896 the Greek Dimitrios Pikelas is the first president and Coubertin the secretary general. On the 25th of March, according to the Julian calendar, that means on the 6th of April in our calendar, the first Olympic Games of modern history commence. Athens, then only 80,000 inhabitants, is turned upside down in those days. In the Panathinaic Stadium, there are about 70,000 spectators and eight photographers. The American James Connolly wins the triple jump on the first day and is the first Olympic winner of modern history. An American is also the winner in the antique discipline of the discus. The French athletes turn out to have the upper hand in cycling, the Germans in wrestling, gymnastics and weightlifting. After the marathon, the Greek soul is happy too and Coubertin says enthusiastically, Spirit and Louis, was a magnificent peasant shepherd, dressed in the popular kilt and quite unfamiliar with the finer points of scientific training, or in fact, the modern notion of training at all. His victory was magnificent in its brilliance and simplicity. I shall never forget the scene, and it left me convinced that psychic forces play a much more active role in sport than is generally believed. The pedagogue is also sportive himself. Apart from boxing and fencing, very important disciplines around the turn of the century, 
Coubertin also likes riding his bicycle. Here, on the green lawn of the Chateau de Mirville, here where he spent his childhood, where he starts his journeys to Le Havre, England, and to the United States. Here, where he often comes back to retire, to muse about the Olympic ideal, for example, about the amateur per se. Amateurism, an admirable mummy that could be presented at the Museum of Boulac as a specimen of the modern art of embalming. Half a century has gone by without it seeming to have suffered in any way from the unceasing manipulations to which it has been submitted. It seems intact. Not one of us expected it to last so long. When the Olympic Games reached their triumphal finish in Stockholm in 1912, when 2,430 athletes have already set their hopes on medals and challenge trophies, Coubertin's Olympic norms pose a problem. The American Jim Thorpe wins gold, but later he has to give it back because he took money for a baseball match. And it was already before Pietri's meandering in 1908 that Coubertin realizes the tendency of sport is toward excess. It aims at more speed, greater height, more strength, always more. That is its drawback in terms of human balance, but so be it. That is also its nobility and its poetry. In 1905, after the death of his father, the young Coubertin has a fortune of 500,000 gold francs, around 6 million euros, and is able to finance everything himself. But he finances too much, and in 1936, even Mirville had to be sold and could only be recovered for the family in 1960. Coubertin's grand-nephew, Jacques de Navassel. Dans cette pièce, on trouve essentiellement le souvenir du passage de Pierre de Coubertin, puisqu'il a in this room, we find, above all, memories of his time in Millville. He even extended the house to have a study, deliberately one with a sunrise view. He spent several hours in this room to work, to write down his thoughts about topics he was fond of. That is to say, the world of academia, education and sports. He spent many years here, either alone or with his family, to work and to have parties, and this room was the central focus of his time in Mirville. Mirville is an inspiring place, just like the Rock of Etretat. On one of his father's watercolor paintings, we can see the family on the beach. Sport can bring joy only in a festive dress, writes Coubertin, and... At the time of Olympia's splendor, the arts and literature in harmonious combination with sports made the Olympic Games great. The same must hold for the future. In 1912, he wins gold for his Ode to the Sport, which is published under the pseudonym Horod and Eschbach, mysteriously in German. O oh sport, you are progress. To serve you well, man must better himself in body and in soul. You enjoin him to observe a loftier hygiene. You require him to refrain from all excess. You teach him wise rules, which will give his effort the maximum intensity without impairing the balance of his health. Coubertin designed the Olympic rings as a symbol for the international unity of sport. Every kind of art is awarded. Olympic art, however, only until 1948. All the same, the connection between sport and art, which was always aspired by Coubertin, seems to exist and to harmonize, not only in the Olympic Museum of Lausanne. Whoever visits Munich and catches sight of the roof of the Olympic Stadium is immediately reminded of the Olympic Games, thanks to the close relationship between sport and art. Willy Daume, the president of the organizing committee, 
had realized back then that the games of Munich needed an aesthetic element, or the opening ceremony, which always contains cultural elements, for example in Sydney when the history of the immigrants was presented in a theater play. There are also people who have a direct connection to Coubertin's name. For example, Coubertin's family that was named after the Coubertin castle in the 15th century. The castle is located in the valley of Chevreuse, 30 kilometers from Paris. That is where Coubertin's niece, Yvonne de Coubertin, founds a cultural foundation, a university for laborers to combine mind and labor. Coubertin at schools also. Since 2002, almost 10,000 students have been awarded the Coubertin School Diploma worldwide, also in Argentina, Norway, Austria, Paraguay, Slovakia and Uruguay. Not only are their required achievement above average in the fields of sport and music and art, but also an attitude of fairness. Here, award for Stefan Frowein graduating from high school in Rhineland-Palatinate. For outstanding achievement, the Pierre de Coubertin diploma. Round about 50 schools worldwide named after Coubertin. Since 1997, groups of students from all continents have been meeting in Coubertin youth camps for one week every second year. See Beijing 2008. Young people between the age of 16 and 18 are striving for the much wanted diploma in the Coubertin Achievement Test. Youth forums, as they are, for example, also held at Olympia, on this sport historical site and at the monument where Coubertin's heart is placed. Sport will be as much in the center as theater or music performances, alongside internationally mixed groups discussing Olympic values. There may be questions of what is the real distance of a marathon run, by whom Coubertin had been influenced, and for which sport discipline he would stand up intensively. That this finally turned out to be modern pentathlon, this is known to most of the students. Coubertin keeps things moving, internationally as much as at home. Here at State High School Pierre de Coubertin in Erfurt, a school specially laid out for sport, where emphasis is put also on social activities, as they are helping ill classmates with their homework, showing commitment in senior homes over the weekend, plus environmental protection. According to the latest survey, the name of Coubertin is mentioned extremely often in German, school books, within the subjects German and history. True to Coubertin's slogan, speak afar, speak frankly, act firmly, intensive communication leading from Erfurt with other schools. At the same time, regular exhibitions linked with questions of how to realize Coubertin's ideas in everyday life. Though by no means Will all people agree with them? I was negatively surprised by his attitude towards women and his opinion concerning their participation in the Olympic Games. But I know that his attitude is also related to the general attitude towards women at that time. Coubertin believes that the Olympic Games should be reserved to the male lone fighter as the solemn and periodic exaltation of male athleticism with the applause of women as a reward. In 1937, two months before his death, he explains, women can take part in all disciplines if they want to, but they shouldn't show themselves off. When Coubertin resigns in 1925, the ban which prohibited women to participate in many disciplines is lifted. 
But when women are completely exhausted, after the 800-meter final at the Olympic Games in Amsterdam, Coubertin feels confirmed in his view. Nowadays, there is no sport without women. The Pierre de Coubertin school in Baalbek, Normandy. Fact, in a school named after Coubertin, women, who originally should only crown the male winners, get active. And there have been plenty more of them. For example, in Pistini, Slovakia. It's like a very important school in Slovak because everybody knows it and we are proud of this name, Pierre de Coubertin. And by now the curriculum comprises sport disciplines Coubertin had not lost a thought of. Disciplines that are, of course, also practiced by young women. Coubertin is very much criticized because of the fact that as the honorary president of the IOC, he rejects to protest against the Olympic Games of 1936 in Berlin. Coubertin is impressed by Karl Diem's achievements, his ingenious and enthusiastic German friend, whom he has known since 1911. Coubertin is accused of having been used for propaganda purposes because he places too much trust in Diem. Coubertin's Olympic ideas fit nicely into the notions of the organizers of the Olympic Games, as, for example, the important thing is not winning, but taking part, chivalry. The fact that he did not come to the Olympic Games of 1936, even though a special train would have been placed at his disposal, and that he refused to go to a cure to Baden-Baden demonstrates that he already kept a certain distance and that he was not just too weak to travel to Berlin. Nevertheless, the Olympic Games in 1936 impressed him, especially because they were the first games that, thanks to their decoration, the bell, the anthem and so on, were considered to be an overall work of art. The good impression that the Olympic Games made on Coubertin can be put down to, I wouldn't say naivety, but rather misestimation. I want to mention again that he was misled by other people, especially by German organizers and friends. According to his passport, he is 1 meter 66 centimeters tall, has gray eyes, an average sized nose and an oval face. During the shooting of this film he is wrongly associated with the discovery of radioactivity or a type of red wine. But then he is doubtlessly found in Paris in relation to other topics. For example, in the chapel Mission étrangère in the Rue du Bac, on a picture his father painted in 1868. On the 12th of March, 1895, he gets married. Since his wife Marie Rotan is Protestant, he marries her first in a Protestant and then in a Catholic church, both within a few hours. The couple has two children, son Jacques, who will never recover from a sunstroke he has as a child, and daughter René. In 1914, Coubertin tries to join in the army and works there later recruiting volunteers. Four years later, he has to sell his house, which he inherited from his father, and he stays in Lausanne with his wife and his daughter. He also chooses the city Lausanne because he wants his Olympic office to be on neutral ground. In 1924, Winter Games take place for the first time in Chamonix. In the same year, Olympia takes place in Paris, and in 1937, Lausanne nominates Coubertin as a citizen of honor. Researchers still discover a lot of new things. For example, that Coubertin encourages a student exchange between American and French students. In 1912, he introduces the modern pentathlon, Shooting, swimming, riding, fencing, running, the same disciplines that belonged to the ancient pentathlon. A discipline where men and women are equal. 
It is true that men and women only compete against each other during the workout, but the degree of difficulty is the same for both of them. Since 2000, women doing the modern pentathlon have also been able to take part in the Olympic Games. Coubertin also commits himself to promoting sport for laborers, personally founds the World Pedagogical Union, additionally an institute for sports pedagogy. Everywhere, more than anything, mutual respect and tolerance. I think the merit of Pierre de Coubertin I think Coubertin's most important achievement was to convince the world that sport can be a way of education. This was what his idea was about, and not the Olympic Games, which were just the means, the vehicle to mediate his and our conviction that sport is an important social element. Which means, for example, for the present, that everybody has free access to the transmission of the Olympic Games. Do not be afraid of becoming long-sighted. Look towards the far horizons of nature and history. From these heights, man draws his strength and motive power. Such are my wishes for all, for the coming generations, for the cities of light and for those which are still in darkness. Keep firm in the saddle, boys. Strike boldly through the mist and have no fear, the future is with you.